Season 2 of Notebook on Cities and Culture is brought to you by Carl Haley and Daniel Murphy. When people argue about whether Portland is a is a small city or a big town, what what are they arguing about exactly? Well, I think what they're arguing about is um, sort of a sense that Portland is simultaneously a place where there's a lot of interesting um, kind of culture and action going on, but it's also a place where it's very easy to get to know all the important people in your little subfield. Mm -hmm. So in that way, it's it's very it's small townish in the sense of being able to make connections, and I think it's been pre it's pretty open to newcomers. Um, it's more open than um, a lot of cities where you have to uh, have the right connections or be part, you know, in politics, you know, have known the right people for a long time. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's a it's a place where it's pretty easy to network, and uh, it's interesting that I think that's one of the things that's attracted a lot of the you know the young college educated people who are sort of putting their brand on Portland in the last in the last few years because it's a place where. Um, you know, you can do interesting things and make interesting connections pretty rapidly. Hmm. It's Notebook on Cities and Culture. I'm Colin Marshall, coming to you from the campus of Portland State University, where my guest Carl Abbott is a professor of urban studies and planning. He's also the author of one of the main books that prepared me to come to Portland this time around, Portland in, Portland in Three Centuries, The Place and Its People. And you can, you can tell exactly what it is by that title. I've also been enjoying rereading his blog posts for Powell's Books, another Portland institution, um, where he wrote about Portland there for a few posts. And I'll ask you this then, has this, has this sense of openness, how much has it always been a feature of Portland? I think it's been a feature certainly for the last, for the last 40 years. Mm. Um, there's a real transformation in the city that comes in from the mid-60s into the 1970s when there is an old guard, a kind of downtown business elite and a generation of political leaders uh, who had been a pretty pretty cozy group of people. Mm -hmm. And there's just generational turnover. So partly it's simply eight people aging out and being replaced by um, a new generation, but also neighborhood activists who kind of push their way into uh, positions of leadership. Mm -hmm. And I think that really opened up the city. It really made it um, – kind of broke down an old guard power structure, which had been uh, pretty successful in kind of manning the the watchtowers mm. for the previous generation or so. Mm. Would, would the, the young Portland enthusiasts of today coming here, would they recognize pre-70s, pre-60s Portland? Uh, they certainly wouldn't recognize Portland before, say, 1965. Mm. Um, they would think they were um, in... Toledo, Ohio. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, it was a you know, it was a working class, you know, manufacturing port city mm. with um, an old, you know, an established elite who'd made their money in railroads and real estate and banking, kind of the classic kind of American growth coalition power elite, who were happily sitting on their money, uh, essentially, uh, and not real interested in having things stirred up. Um, so in 1965, there were basically no interesting restaurants. Uh, I mean, you could get a good steak, but that's, you know, you could get fried chicken and dumplings, but, you know, sort of the food scene wasn't there. You know, the cultural scene was not there. Um, there were a few uh, artists, for example, who were coming, in, coming to Portland to... Um, teach at the Portland Art Museum, you know, school or maybe associated with Portland State, which again is just, you know, a young and university beginning to grow. So there was was change in the air, but a very, very different place. Hmm. It, it seems that even, you know, you go through the three centuries of Portland and, and well, what, what are the forces, though, that, that made Portland distinctive even before it became even more distinctive in, yeah. in the mid 1960s, what, what were the forces operating on it that made it a, a different place, you know, than anywhere else on the West Coast? Well, I think Portland has always been historically very, very tightly 
connected and identified with its surrounding landscape. Um, partly it's the it's Seattle, too, in terms of just being able to look out a window and see mountains or see water. Uh, but But Seattle has always been a much more cosmopolitan city than Portland, or at least until recent years. Uh, and Portland has been very much a city oriented to uh, the the resource industries of the Columbia River Basin, to you know, to fishing, to logging, to agriculture. Uh, and that, I think that stamp is still there. Uh, it's now seen, I think, in much, it no longer is a whole bunch of you know, loggers and farm workers coming in during the winter because there are no jobs and hanging out in what's now Old Town in and drinking up their wages in saloons and, <laughs> yes. and you know, at doing that kind of thing. But so it's now much more sophisticated. It's, mm-hmm. you know, locally based agriculture and uh, a food scene that mm-hmm. links to the, you know, northern Oregon wine industry and yeah. uh, and obviously the recreational uh, connections. Portland is often compared to Austin, Texas as another kind of cool city, what young people like and interesting things are going on. And um, not to put a knock on Texas, but we're a lot closer to really nice mountains. And I think our ocean is nicer than the Gulf of Mexico. So, and we're just closer to that outdoors. So that if you like, if you want to combine the connection to region with an interesting city, this is a really good place to be. I was just talking to a friend yesterday who was saying the same thing. It's like, yes, it's like Austin. I suppose Austin is a, is a comparison, but the, the geography and the, the landscape is so much more welcoming here. It's a little arid over there in Austin, as you would expect. I mean, it's yeah. Texas. Nobody's making any claims about it that, uh, that, it's a, that it's a garden spot necessarily. But is, is Austin, is that a, for you an interesting comparison just in a, in a pure urban sense to, to see how those two oft-compared cities differ or are similar? I think it's an interesting comparison. Um, I mean, there's some important differences in that, you know, Austin is the state capital and has you know, a mega university. You know, Portland State is a good rising university, but we're not, you know, we're a scale of magnitude, you know, different than a University of Texas. Mm-hmm. So there's some differences there. And then, um, you know, non-Texans say, well, if you have to live in Texas, you have to live in Austin because it's sort of not like Texas. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think there's some, you know, Texans may or may not say that, but outsiders sort of have, have that image. Yeah. Um, Portland is different. You know, it's not, you know, there's a lot of worry in Oregon about the kind of rural urban divide that mm-hmm. Portland is kind of doesn't care about the rest of the state anymore. Um, I think we're actually still pretty, pretty closely connected. Mm-hmm. Um, in some ways, the, the, the connections have been evolving. So again, the um, we don't grow the same things. We Oregonians mm. uh, don't grow the same, quite the same things in the Willamette Valley that people did a hundred years ago. Um, you know, there are wine grapes, and you know where there used, there may have been wheat farms before, and the connection is somewhat different. Um, I think the the problem, the urban rural problem in Oregon is. It's not an Oregon problem. It's a national problem of how – what's the future of kind of resource production in the United States? Mm. Um, you know, how many – you know, you need fewer and fewer farmers to produce, you know, food. Um, the timber industry is much more efficient than it was a generation ago, which is, you know, how industries are supposed to evolve. You substitute, you know, capital and machinery for manpower, mm. but that means – there are fewer jobs in the old logging communities. Well, even if you're cutting down more, as many trees as you're used to, there are far fewer workers involved. So how do you know, rural communities kind of reinvent themselves for, um, you know, for a future? Interestingly, one of the ways, one of the things that's been happening in Oregon is um, because of abundant hydroelectric power and relatively cheap electricity – Lots of number of companies like Facebook and Google have been locating server farms in small Oregon communities where the land is cheap, where the electricity is cheap. They don't employ tons of workers. They employ some workers. But it's this kind of of 
a new way in which to use some of the old Oregon resources. Right. You're, you're still doing resource usage yeah. in some sense. And, yeah. you know, Portland itself, it's like you, you, nowadays you look around, you, you, you couldn't imagine a town of uh, people less, less employed in, in, in farming or uh, in, in, in resource extraction. You know what I mean? Just walking around the street, it seems to be so the knowledge economy, if, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, it certainly is the knowledge economy, especially in the what I call the core of progressive Portland or cool Portland. Uh, where um, people's main connection with, you know, apart from, you know, snowboarding or going to the going to the ocean, their main connection to resource production is keeping a couple chickens in the backyard. <laughs> but um, there is an industrial Portland that that's coexisting. Mm. Uh, you know, it's a major port. That's a major, actually has a substantial manufacturing sector. Not just high tech, you know, chip fabrication, but also there's a, a lot of industrial employment in uh, transportation equipment, metal fabrication. No mega companies, but you know, Freightliner makes trucks, and that's a division of of Daimler. Um, people build barges in Portland. Um, they built they're now they build rail cars in Portland. Uh, Boeing has a uh, a subsidiary plant here that makes parts, uh, and there are lots of businesses that make make things out of metal, which is certainly not the, you know, of course people also make really high end bicycles out of metal. Yeah, so the, there's that connection too. But a few of those on the streets here. Yes, exactly. That that's not, you know, that's employing a couple hundred people, and the um, the barge builders are maybe employing, you know, ten times that many. Mm. So. It's an interesting contrast that it remains an industrial city, you know, a major port, especially for exports, um, especially for, for essentially for raw material exports, for for grain exports, lumber exports, minerals. Um, I'm not sure whether it's still how much of it's still the case, but you know, containers full of Idaho potatoes being shipped to Japan for McDonald's in Tokyo. Yeah. Uh, so I'm a big – happen to be big, a big advocate of remembering this kind of industrial waterfront component of Portland's economy, which if you're downtown, you don't see. As soon as you go um, a little bit north of downtown along the uh, Willamette Riverfront and the Columbia, you see um, industrial zones. You see ship repair yards. Uh, you see major uh, shipping terminals. Um, it's sort of as if there were um, Pittsburgh and Austin kind of blended together. <laughs> you don't have to go far before you see you see Portland doing the things it's done for a very long time. Then yeah, exactly. Um, mm. So so the history of the city is still is still very much present. There there are industries that we used to have that are no longer present. Um, it used to be a major uh, meat packing center, for example, oh. uh, Swift and Company had a very substantial. You know, there's stockyards and and meat packing, which is which has gone away. Uh, there was a lot of um, use of wood products, um, sash and door manufacturing, um, companies that manufactured kind of cheap furniture out of out of uh, softwood, oh. uh, public bunk beds for the. Lumber camps for the people who cut down those trees to make the furniture. <laughs> no, you, you mentioned you mentioned Seattle, uh, which comes up, of course, in the book as as this the city to the north that Portland would compete with as well. And it's it's, it's contrast people often often use whether they're in Seattle or Portland. Like, is the, if we're doing this, are we like Seattle? Are we like Portland? If we do that, you know, and I uh, I happen to have grown up in Seattle and think Seattle could. Should copy Portland in certain ways, but um, tell me, I mean, what, what, how illustrative is is Seattle through history as as a, as as something to compare Portland to? Maybe in sim- similar to Austin. I mean, but this is more regional. You know, what what uh, what is Seattle to the history of Portland? Well, Seattle is, of course, Seattle's the the younger sibling that outpassed, outranked, out you know, out competed Portland in the sense of just having grown into the bigger city. Mm. You know, Portland was Portland was the first large city in along the northwest coast, and until 1910, it was the largest. It was larger than Seattle. Mm. Seattle then edged past Portland 
in the early 20th century and then really surged past Portland after 1960. So um, th- it's always it's always been a competitor. Um, Seattle's had a couple advantages. It's had the advantage of, um, in particular, of a couple big homegrown industries, um, Boeing and then Microsoft, that those are both essentially accidents, you know, you know, it's an accident. You know, it's the accident of birth that Bill Gates and you know Paul Allen were, you know, grew up in Seattle and decided, you know, they started their company, started their company in Albuquerque, yeah. and then decided after a couple of years they wanted to come home, yeah. um, but there wasn't anything special about it. Was just, you know, wasn't anything special about Seattle that made Microsoft. It was just. You know those guys right. well, who just have Seattle talent, home. you know. Yeah. <laughs> and now, but of course, huge economic impact, huge economic impact of Boeing mm-hmm. before that, um, and in Seattle, the impact of having again a in basically a top ten university, or certain in research dollars. Uh, university of Washington is usually ranks in the top ten in the United States. So mm-hmm. having that in the city. So all those factors, uh, well, they've done two things. That it when it's meant that Seattle, uh, when times are good in Seattle, they've been they're really really good. Mm-hmm. The boom is really booms. When they're bad, uh, things could get fairly bad. If you're you know again the Boeing depression of a few uh, a few decades ago, uh, when you know the economy in Seattle was in terrible shape. Mm-hmm. Um, is an example of, in that case, kind of a single industry town. Um, you know, if Microsoft you know, fails to reinvent itself for the next decade, right. what, will, what will the impact of that be? They've managed, you know, so far to, you know, survive kind of, you know, changes in their industry, but there's no guarantee. Right. Um, the, other, the other difference is Seattle has always had a – it seems to me a kind of a more go-getter attitude. Uh, some people call it the Chamber of Commerce promoter attitude <laughs> or are simply kind of a more entrepreneurial spirit. Um, and that especially showed up in the, I think, back in the 1950s and 60s, just sort of before I, I think Portland was transformed. I think Seattle transformed itself more quickly than, than Portland did into kind of a modern city. Um, Portland didn't... Um, Portland failed to invest in a lot of infrastructure improvements, mm. port, port modernization in the 1950s, and Seattle did. Mm. Um, uh, Seattle held a World's Fair. Uh, Portland got left behind. Right. They uh, got the Space Needle out of it. They got the Space Needle. And if you're from the East Coast, you're willing to think, you're willing to admit that there's one big city up, up there, <laughs> and you know it has the Space Needle because you've seen that. Um, <laughs> And Portland doesn't have that kind of an icon. Mm. And so to convince people that there are kind of two big cities here, uh, it's it's been a lot easier in the last decade than it was you know, a generation ago. Right. Um, you, you mentioned the 60s as, as when Portland changed and, and when Seattle got big. I mean, was that, was that an era when a lot of American cities were becoming what they are today or specifically the Northwest or – or what, what was it about the, the, the mid-60s? Well, I think what's happening in um, sort of between, let's say, 1965 and 1975 or 80 is um, some cities suddenly find themselves in very, very big trouble. Uh, the, the whole deindustrial process, deindustrialization process in the Northeast and the Midwest where um, the manufacturing mainstays in a number of cities began – Transferring their operations to uh, to the Sun Belt, or closing their factories in Ohio and reopening in uh, Juarez, um, or shifting production. You know, you know Pittsburgh steel industry finding itself suddenly in competition with Japan and Korea, and some of those cities went through job loss. You know, uh, population decline. Um, at the same time, cities that can think of it either as the South and West, as the Sun Belt, uh, 
some of these are some of it's picking up manufacturing from, uh, especially in the South, picking up manufacturing from the Northeast and the Middle West. Uh, some of it's the rise of the leisure industries, both recreation and retirement. Um, some of it's the the new uh, information economy, uh, which has obviously New York and Boston are remain key players in that, but which be, is very much is very very heavily. Um, California West Coast, uh, Silicon Valley, you know Microsoft, um, you know the Portland area gets its you know high tech industries. Texas is a high tech center, so it's kind of an economic wave where um, the one wave is breaking and kind of crashing in the Northeast and Midwest, and a, and a new wave is kind of carrying a, a different set of cities, you know. On the upswing, right, right. And you've, you've called Portland, I believe, conservatively progressive. Well, what does that mean exactly? Um, Portlanders are Portlanders like what they have, hmm. um, and uh, partly that means they like the natural environment, they like the natural setting, they like access to uh, the nat- you know, to, to nature within the fabric of the city, uh, you know, river and parks. Um, so they're conservative in the sense of conservationist, um, and they're also very. They like neighbor. They like their, their neighborhoods, um, and these are both the hip neighborhoods that have been caught on in the last decade, and also the nicer, older kind of old nineteen twenties middle class neighborhoods, streetcar suburb neighborhoods. So, virtually. You know, very little of the city has been kind of thrown away to be totally redone. It's been very often um, conserved neighborhoods, recycled neighborhoods, mm-hmm. and um, you see it in the um, in public buildings as well. There's a tendency to like to take, you know, if you have a nice old building, a nice old public building, you rehab it and revitalize it for another half century of use, right. uh, rather than building something new and shiny. I believe you've drawn a contrast to the Seattle Library on, yes. on, on the Powell's Block. Yes. Um, <laughs> you know, Portland has a very nice central library that was built in the 1910s, you know, Georgian-style architecture, very functional inside, and, the, and we simply, you know, updated it for, um, for another, basically for, for a new century. Mm-hmm. You know, Seattle, which had admittedly a not very nice sort of 1950s era you know, Central Library brought in a, you know, a brand name architect to do a very flashy building that um, architectural critics mostly like mm. that I think isn't very functional inside. Um, I think I tend to be a minority when I mm. when I diss it, but uh, <laughs> I mean, that that makes for nice arguments. <laughs> they, they built it after I left Seattle anyway, so I feel like I could I can non-participate in the arguments, but it's an interesting argument that pops up about those kind of buildings, you yes. know. And I wonder if the the the, the sense of that Portland, uh, the growth has been in some sense deliberately limited in Portland and the sort of the, the, the iconic the iconic architecture is kept to kept to a or the deliberately iconic architecture is kept to a minimum. What, what does that say about 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 Portland, but the way Portland governs itself? Um I think it's it shows it's a city with a very kind of dispersed leadership. Um, I mean, our, the city itself has a the somewhat archaic um, council system, you know, city commission system of government, in which there are five a mayor and four com- city commissioners elected at large, and each of them has management responsibilities as well as kind of the legislative responsibilities. So they're they're simultaneously a five person executive. Um, and a legislative body, so that disperses, you know, power. It's a a weak mayor in the sense that the mayor can't simply make things happen. The mayor has to persuade, uh, council members have to persuade. Um, so major change. So change tends to be incremental, um, and it's a strong participatory um, ethos. Um, Portlanders love to set up committees to talk about things. Um, I mean, it, it is, 
And does that mean that they get talked to death and nothing happens? Sometimes. Mm. Sometimes it means you get talked through and find a consensus on which people can can <laughs> can move forward. Um, but it's a, a pretty deliberative uh, kind of process mm. and I think pretty dispersed power. Also because there's no single dominant industry. There's no – there are – Important players for sure, but there's no um, no equivalent of you know the big three automakers. Uh, there's no equivalent of uh, like Intel, which is a, basically a suburban employer, is the largest private employer with you know fewer than ten thousand employees mm. for in a city of metropolitan area of more than two million. So uh, there's no single um, company that can call shots. Yeah, they can certainly have influence. And and yet Portland gets thought of, it seems to me, as, as a city where things do get done. I mean, they, they, people point to the rail system, for example, yeah. or, or the, the, even the bicycles-related improvements. It's, I mean, I, I think Seattle does as well. I think, well, they, they got all that done. How did, they, how did they get that done so seemingly quickly? You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, you know, the, the quickness, for example, of the uh, bicycle culture and the, you know, the, the bicycle infrastructure mm-hmm. – um, is the result of it's kind of there's sort of 20 years of work sort of building interest, building consensus, building momentum uh, first by outsiders, by kind of the, the pushy bike people who <laughs> keep telling the city it's got to do things and keep you know showing up at meetings and being obnoxious and generally you know push, pushing, pushing, pushing. Mm-hmm. And then there's a point at which the city decides to co-opt that effort to create its own bicycle program, mm-hmm. which then begins to build momentum. And so there's there's a kind of agitation stage and then an acceptance stage. Um, and Portland is pretty good at kind of bringing people – if you're well-mannered mm-hmm. in kind of procedural terms, um, you will eventually get invited into those committee meetings and you'll you'll be part of the – get to be part of the discussion. So I think that's what's happened with it's what happened with the bicycle area, for example. Hmm. Um, Portland has been doing kind of smart growth before people had coined the term. Hmm. So the Portland you see now is the result of 40 plus years of kind of incremental changes. Hmm. So it's, it's taken a lot of patience. Hmm. Um, there are people essentially that sort of the one kind of political figure who's still – who's kind of there at the beginning and still around is uh, Congressman Earl Blumenauer mm-hmm. who got into politics in his 20s, um, has been in the state legislature and then into local office now in the you know, U.S. House of Representatives. Kind of he, – he's provided kind of consistent, you know, some, some continuity there. Mm-hmm. Um, the light rail is interesting because um, – the one other thing about kind of the Portland way of doing things is um, it's a pretty honest place mm. um, and honest partly in terms of just it's not it's not corrupt um, this what makes a scandal in the amount of money you have to misappropriate to become a scandal in Oregon is very small. Mm. Um, it's just a scale issue? There's, it's, it's too easy to see corruption? Maybe it's easy to see corruption. Mm. Um, there is a kind of civic culture, a kind of public regarding civic culture. So, mm. uh, so, it's, so the assumption is that everybody's honest, mm. um, which is not the assumption in every city or community. Sure. Um, the other way in which we're kind of, you know, you know we're honest is by you know, once deals are made, they kind of they get kept. Uh, so the light rail system, which is in, you know, has been in development since you know the nineteen the mid nineteen seventies. Um, you know, building a light rail system is ex- slow and expensive, and essentially a deal was worked out, a tacit deal was worked out that the first line would serve, you know, the east side of the metropolitan area and out into Multnomah County in the the suburb of Gresham. That then another line, the next line would serve the west side suburbs and communities of Beaverton and Hillsborough, and a third, and then the lines would serve the third suburban county, Clackamas County, to the south, and 
Clark County to the north in, in Washington across the Columbia River if they wanted it, which they haven't yet. But you can't build it all at once. If you wait, we'll get around to you and we'll remember you. Right. <laughs> You've got, you got to start somewhere, but yeah. there's also you wait your turn as well. Yes, exactly. Hmm. It's it's something though that it, it's it's something that Portland seems not to have struggled with so much uh, as as much as say you know I live in Los Angeles and they they're building a, their light rail system. I mean it's, it seems like they have about half of what they need right now, but uh, there's sort of and there's endless sources of delay uh, there and a lot of uh, battling between the municipalities and whatnot and, and lawsuits. Is that something Portland gets around somehow? Uh- by and large, we have, and I think it's partly because of the um, among different among the different political jurisdictions. There is the sense of um, there is a, an idea that the you know that everybody benefits if if some parts of the area benefit, there are going to be spillover benefits to other areas. Uh, the key suburban uh, municipalities have kind of accepted and embraced a role as. You know, recognizing that downtown central Portland is going to be the center of the metropolitan area, mm. but that they can be sort of important nodes out at the end of the you know rail line Hillsborough or and Gresham and ideally uh, Vancouver and Clark County. Um, so they see the they look at um, I don't know whether they've done this explicitly, but analogy might be in in Washington D.C. area. So there's the metro system converges on. The center of Washington, but you know, out, you know, in Bethesda, you know, served by the you know, have a huge node of, you know, kind of secondary development. So, um, you know, Hillsborough, Oregon, is never going to be Bethesda, Maryland. Um, we don't have the National Institutes of Health for one thing, Sorry. but uh, that's the kind of idea. Mm-hmm. So, a sense of uh, again, that's part of the deal making. We can sort of see. Our complement, you know, people can see complementary mm-hmm. roles. Um, where that's not working right now is in Clackamas County, which is the uh, suburban county to the south of the of the city, mm-hmm. which is a very mixed um, kind of political environment because it has um, a, a mixture of quite affluent upper middle class suburbs, um, some kind of middle to working class suburban areas and on its kind of outer fringes, kind of semi-rural communities that are just being suburbanized and aren't too happy about the process. <laughs> and there's you know serious controversy in Clackamas County right now about the county's um, participation in the expansion of the light rail system. Mm. You know, the light rail system has one line into one part of the county – is in the, the process of building a line that will have two stops in another part of the county, and the county elected political leadership is in favor of that expansion, has voted you know, a share of funding for it. There is a percentage of voters who aren't happy about that at all, mm-hmm. and it's – it's it's be interesting to see how that plays out, sort of where – is Clackamas County decide the voters of Clackamas County decide sort of they don't want to be part of the team anymore? Mm, I see. That's it. Even even given that though, it seems like the city suburb relations here seem seem fairly sound. I think of you know Seattle where they always seem particularly poor to me or particularly combative. I mean, would you would you say this is a place where the the city and the suburbs get along better than in most American areas? I think they do. I think they get along fairly well. Um, and part of it, I think, is this the sense that there are common interests and we can we can make deals. Um, there is, you know, Portland is also a very um, tradition, you know, historically a very racially homogeneous city. Um, it has a lot more ethnic and racial variety than it did twenty years ago. Uh, but it's um, the suburbs have never felt themselves. And especially the African American population in the Portland area is, is quite small for most American cities. So the suburbs haven't had to fear Portland as kind of this, you know, fear waves and waves of black residents kind of in, invading, 
invading their neighborhoods, um, right, right, right. which is in, you know, Chicago, which, which, which in Chicago or Detroit, you know, is a very real cause of city suburb right. uh, tensions. And at this point, suburban areas are as racially diverse as the city of Portland. Mm. In some areas, more so. Um, you know, there are school districts on both the suburban school districts on both the east and west sides of Portland, which are just as I think more more ethnically di- racially diverse than the city of Portland schools themselves. Mm. So, so in that sense, you can't say suburbs can't say. We're white Anglo and you're a racially diverse city and we don't want to have anything to do with you. Everybody's all – which is the, which is more and more the case in most American metropolitan areas that the uh, the suburbs is, is no longer white suburbs versus ethnic you know, city. It's new immigrants come into suburban areas just as much as inner city areas and et cetera. It, it reminds me you – know, I think of the um – the way people talk about the livability of Portland, you know, that, that, that's often praised as how livable a city it is. It's, it's praised in the way that people praise Northern Europe, you know, Sweden or the Scandinavian countries about, about their livability. And, but then they say the same thing, which is people I talk to here, they, they will also say, well, it's not that diverse here in Portland. That's true. Maybe, you know, maybe that can be improved. And they say the same thing about, you know, the Swedens of the world. Um, <laughs> what, what is it about the relative, relatively less diversity and, and that sense of livability are there any is there any relationship there do livable places get less diverse somehow or do they get diverse slowly or is there what what is there any relationship at all i mean what's happening the diversity is uh, well there are two ways of thinking about that one is kind of a gentrification process mm. and that in the last particularly the last 5 or 6 years there are a number of neighborhoods on the east side of the city which historically have been working class and racially mixed mm-hmm. where um, there's so many kind of hip, young, college-educated pe- white people coming in that they're outbidding and changing the you know, character of those neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. So there is a there is a gentrification displacement uh, going on. Again, it's not massive in scale, but it's definitely uh, perceptible. Mm-hmm. Um, there is a sorting, kind of a sorting process that the diversity – I mean, the diversity in, if you're looking at kind of ethnic and racial diversity, um, the diversity is not in the close-in neighborhoods with where everybody likes to ride bicycles sure. and all the cool restaurants are and mm-hmm. just a really great place to live. And it's where I live, um, where I've lived for 34 years. And I think it's gotten more livable and cooler than it was before. But the diversity is out in the suburbs mm. and it's, it's out where if you're want to commute by bicycle, you'd rather live closer in. Right. Uh, and um, if you live in, if you live out um, in the far Eastern side of Portland or Gresham, um, for example, um, you're going to find, that's where you're going to find uh, racial and ethnic diversity. It's also where you're going to find uh, at this point, more kind of, Kind of poor people, uh, people for whom, you know, riding a bicycle may not be, you know, an environmental lifestyle choice, but it might be they can't afford a car. Right. Um, not that they don't want a car, but that they really, you know, they're they're stuck with a bicycle. Right. Um, so maybe it, there's some differences there that um, I think are real. And you mentioned that before 1965, you know, someone one, one of these one of these. Cool people on bicycles today might might uh, look at Portland and think of it as a bit, a bit of a Toledo, Ohio. And I, I, as I recall, you grew up in, in Dayton yourself, yes. right? And so, it's, wh- wh- when did Portland become for you an object of fascination? Considering that you you didn't come, you weren't born in the Northwest, but you you, you came here, right? Um, Portland is a bit of an accident for me. Uh, you know, by um, I was I after. I, I went, grew up in the Middle West, went to school in the East Coast, the Middle West, um, taught for one year. My first job after, out of graduate school, I taught for one year in Denver. Well, we liked Denver. It was a nice place. Had, there are big mountains there. And uh, But then we, I was teaching uh, in Virginia, in, in Southern Virginia, and it was a good, a good job. You know, my colleagues, I got along with my colleagues. I was doing 
okay, but my wife and I sort of looked around us and, you know, and said, do we want to live here the rest of our lives? And the answer was no. Mm. So we said, well, what's, where would we want to live? He said, well, we want to live in the West. Um, we want to live in a fairly large city near mountains. And we didn't consider California out of pure prejudice. <laughs> but it really, it really, Denver, Seattle, and Portland right. were the three cities that were on our list. We probably should have added Albuquerque, but it just didn't occur, occur to us. Mm. Uh, and we both started looking for jobs. And my wife got a job in Portland that would support us both. So we decided to move here. Mm. At that point, we would have been just as happy to move to Seattle or move to Denver. Uh, we didn't know Portland. Uh, I had never visited here. Um, but we we knew it by reputation because by that time it had started turning up on lists of livable cities. Yes, already. Yeah. Hmm. When, 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 what year was that? And you know, what was the sort of Portland you found at that time? What was it, what was it like then? Um, it was a place where um, we're just beginning the transition from – uh, stodgy to cool. Um, the restaurants, you know, rather than having to say, oh my God, there are 10 new interesting restaurants this week. I, I can't eat enough. You know, it was like every six months there's a sort of interesting possibility. So things like the restaurant scene, uh, the music scene were, were just beginning to change. But it was a city where the neighborhoods were already kind of engaged you know, full of activists. So it, it had gone through a kind of re- neighborhood revolution in which uh, neighborhoods were uh, had an important voice at City Hall. Um, and we'd come from a city where um, we were involved in our local neighborhood association, but you had to spend most of your energy battling to be heard. Uh-huh. And in Portland, that battle had already been won so that people would listen to neighborhoods. They wouldn't always agree, but they would listen to them. And we could see that the um, the nice – what we thought of as the nice older neighborhoods were still in reasonable shape. Wow. Um, what I noticed as kind of a indicator, and it's still true in Portland, was that uh, the neighborhood movie theaters were still, sh- were still functioning and they're still showing – Two or three of them were showing dirty movies, but <laughs> many of them were were showing kind of second run family movies. Right. Just you know, and in many cities that had those kind of theaters had either converted to you know to triple X movies or closed down right. in the nineteen sixties, and they're still functioning in Portland, which was a kind of indicator of the viability of that kind of local neighborhood life. Right. Which has got just gotten stronger. Yeah, there's more the, more movie theaters, more more independent theaters, more revival houses than there have been before, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And in the decades you've been here, I mean, what what is what has changed? What strikes you as having changed about your day to day day to day experience of Portland? If if anything has has changed a, a lot, other than you know, the, the amount of restaurants available, yeah. um, what what feels what is what has felt different over these decades here? I think it feels kind of more vibrant than ever. Um, the new generation of Portlanders are very, you know, they're very entrepreneurial. Um, they probably call it do-it-yourself rather than entrepreneurial. That would, probably so. Yeah, but it's the same. I think it's the some of the, it, in many ways the same kind of impulse that mm. they're they're here. They have energy. They have ideas. Um, you know, I have the privilege of, you know, teaching in a program with a national reputation that attracts students from. Attracts local students, but attracts lots of students from around the country. So, mm. I I also have the. It's very interesting to you know talk to students from other parts of the country. So why did you want to come and right. study planning in Portland? And right. why, why did they want to? What are you hearing from them? Well, it's it's three things. They they want to. Maybe it's three things. I'll count and see here. <laughs> uh, it's you know they think Portland is going to is a cool place to be. So it'd be fun to you know spend you know two or three years in their 20s there and see what happens. Um, they also, Portland and Oregon, have a reputation of innovative you know, land use planning. So they, they come for that reason. Um, sometimes they're outdoorsy um, as well. Um, they also come, I think, because they see possibilities of 
sticking around and making a difference. Hmm. You know, plenty of them go, you know, end up taking jobs in other parts of the country. It's, you know, or they're portable degrees, but a lot of them come not only because they want to live here uh, and kind of enjoy it as the place as a consumer, but because they see opportunities to, uh, you know, to make it, you know, even better for whatever direction better they think is going to be. Right. Yeah. I think of Portland, and I, I visit fairly often, and it, it always strikes me as Portland as, as being unimprovably Portlandish. You know, it's unimprovably Portland-esque. Like, this is, it seems to me that really the vision of what Portland should be is kind of, it kind of already exists. I mean, maybe I would think different if I, if I lived here, but, I mean, what do you see, you know, th- looking at it as, as a, a scholar of urban studies and urban planning, what do you see as the interesting sort of frontier in, in urban Portland? Is it what's, where, where change might happen next, or what's just sort of, What's drawing your attention about Portland now? Because the, the the locus of change can be hard to spot for an outsider. Because yeah. you already think, well, it's, it's Portland. You know, it's it, it's yeah. it's cool. It's already it's already done, but it's not done. I guess. Yeah. I, mean, I think that the the real um, the frontier is the is the inner suburban ring. Mm. It's where it's where the most again the ethnic diversity is. Um, it's where um, it's where the political challenges are. Um, mm. It's you know how do you particularly how do you incorporate um, kind of new immigrant generations into a political process, um, and in a sense the question is how do you how do you get them on board with kind of Portlandism? <laughs> uh, Portlandism. You define Portlandism how? Um, kind of the uh, civic-minded participatory approach to um, kind of incremental problem solving. Hmm. Um, that's a bunch of stuff strung together, but I, it, Makes sense. I, I yeah, and um, particularly I think the um, you know the large you know Mexican American um, Central American population um, how do you how do you accommodate how do you bring folks like that into kind of the political process hmm. as not just as a group to be dealt with but as kind of p- full participants and shapers who will. Kind of its vector patterns will will move, you know, Portland in a different direction. Mm-hmm. The same with uh, there's a substantial in the metro area substantial um, kind of population. Uh, it's now into second generation of um, Eastern European, Romanian, Ukraine, you know, Russian mm-hmm. um, immigrants, uh, many of whom are um, socially, religiously very conservative. Um, What's their role going to be within the? You know, are they ever going to sign on to Portlandism? Right, right. Or, or if they do, how will they change it? Do you have any signs of whether they will or won't sign on, or what might happen? Are there, or is it too early to say for any of this? Oh, I think it's a little bit too early to say. I think it's for the Eastern Europeans. It's going. It's the second generation. Will the? How important is kind of the cultural? You know, how much will they retain kind of the cultural patterns and? Biases and fears of their uh, of the kind of parents' generation. Mm-hmm. How much of a, to what degree are they just everyday working class Portlanders, right. middle class Portlanders? You know, and the question there is: there's assimilation into kind of American consumer culture, mm-hmm. which is obviously an easy step to take. Um, and what about assimilation into kind of the the Portland? I think of it as a political culture. Hmm. Um, I mean, the, and the other challenge actually is getting um, hip, college-educated white folks in their 20s who've come here to do interesting, cool things hmm. also to become part of a political process, right. to become involved in uh, community shaping, to be willing to sit down on those committees. And that, I think that that happens you know, over time, hmm. and there's an issue of just getting these those two groups engaged: either the vast group of yeah. immigrants and the generation after them, and 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 the group of of you know uh, Portlandia type people. Yes. I guess is that I hesitate to bring up that show's name, but you know, yeah. it's sometimes it's irresistible. Um, yes. Is it is it something that seems like it's going to be very difficult with 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 those two groups to get them engaged, or are they are they not? Naturally, politically engaged parts of the population. Uh, I think that the kind of the Portlandia folks, it's 
it's a you know there is there is a kind of a generation of cynicism about politics. Um, I think there was, I think there's Obama disappointment that he wasn't Jesus Christ come, <laughs> you know, to 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 bring to, to bring the kingdom of God. Yes, of course. That, that in fact he's a practical pragmatic politician who's, in my humble opinion, a lot better than the alternatives. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so generating energy and willingness to, you know. It's sort of hard with Congress behaving as it has recently, but to get people willing to accept that there is a, you know, you can do things through a political process. Um, I mean, it's interesting. Our, our current mayoral campaign um, has somebody who is a kind of policy wonk insider, mm -hmm. Charlie Hales, and somebody who is a probably would describe himself as a policy wonk outsider, Jefferson Smith, mm -hmm. who. In fact, is an insider. He was grew up with in Democratic Party politics, but he made a choice to start his political career by moving to the eastern Multnomah County to represent this much more diverse, ethnically and economically diverse kind of constituency than you know, where he he grew up in my neighborhood, which is you know it's like a upper middle class, you know. 96% for Obama, 3% for Nader, and 1% right. for everybody else kind of neighborhood. Uh, it's not very diverse. <laughs> uh, but he, he, made a, you know, he made a deliberate choice to, you know, to seek out a kind of a different political constituency and environment. So there's – I think of the, the context that Portland is in and in the context of American politics or America itself. And it, it's, I always want to say that Portland has somehow made its own reality within America. How, how correct is that to say? Um, oh, I think it has. Um, I mean, we're, you know, what's one of the advantages uh, of the American federal system where states can go off and do their own thing, you know, within certain limits. So, um, you know, Oregon is, you know, it's a, at this point, it's a um, safely progressive state, um, which is, again, a change of the last 30 or 40 years because it was, um, in the 1950s, it was a Republican state with a Democratic Party that was trying to compete. Now it's a Democratic state with a Republican Party that can't has yet to figure out how to compete. Oh yes, uh, because it's the problem of you know the Republican center keeps kind of disappearing, mm. which is how what you have to be. So we you know, we had a tradition of progressive kind of progressive Republican leadership. Um, Governor Tom McCall, Senator Mark Hatfield, and they'd be hard put to find, get a lot of traction um, in the Republican Party today. Mm. Things have changed. Things have shifted a little too much from where they were. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. Now, finally, the speaking of making one's own reality, there, there's I don't know how much you want to talk about this, but off mic beforehand, you mentioned your interest in, in science fiction, and be, you, people can detect that from reading a certain section of, of Portland in Three Centuries, but. Uh, you're interested in that as well as uh, combining that with uh, with your interest in cities and uh, science fiction and cities together. You know, what 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 uh, what do you find of interest where those two subjects converge? Well, I'm interested in. I think that there are kind of certain, like in a lot of writing, certain kind of types and tropes that reappear in science. You know, there are certain kinds of cities that keep reappearing. There's a kind of the city is mega machine, mm. the, and then there is. On a very different scale, there's the near future in which the suburbs turn kind of wild and dangerous and decay. Um, and there, I just think there are these kind of patterns that keep reappearing that I think you can relate to different aspects of kind of urban theory and how people have thought about, you know, you know the past and future of cities. Um, in, a, in a sense, I th it's, it's a variation on the theme that we can only think about the future in terms of what we know about our past and present. Right. And we, we take those ideas and we, we twist them a little bit and project them onto the future. <laughs> it's, it's, I, I think of, you know, in science fiction, often, often utopia is the, 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 the construction of a utopia. And it seems like Portland itself is some kind of utopian project at times, does it not? Um, yes, it, it could be. Um, mm. But it's a very kind of practical incremental utopia. Right. Well, that's the only kind of utopia you want to be in, right? right. No one wants to be in the impractical utopia. Yes. And um, 
my favorite science fiction writer is uh, Kim Stanley Robinson, mm-hmm. who's written both a fantastic trilogy about the settlement of Mars and before that a, a trilogy about different futures for uh, Orange County, right. California. And essentially his – kind of the underlying theme in, in his work is, you know, this is the wrong quote, but utopia is how we live our lives. In other words, utopia is – is always in the process of creation. It's not an end state. It's a, mm. it's a process of, of trying to live good lives and make, make, make our surroundings better. Um, and in that, in that sense, Portland is a utopian project. Mm. It's a, a utopian journey, never a utopian destination. That's, exactly. You can't arrive there. Yes, exactly. Mm. I've been speaking here at Portland State University with Carl Abbott, professor of urban studies and planning and author of Portland in Three Centuries, The Place and its people, which I consider to be the book on Portland. Carl, thanks so much for taking the time today. My pleasure. This has been Notebook on Cities and Culture. I've been Colin Marshall, and you can keep up with the cultural creators, internationalists, and observers of the urban scene on the show at colinmarshall.org. Thanks. And special thanks to everyone who backed this season on Kickstarter. Danny Bolson, Brad and Laramie on Movies, Paul Doyle, Umberto Grant, Matt Howie, Andrew Hovenick, Mark Hines, Mary Gillander, Eric Graham, Will Graham, John French, Andrew Philippon Jr., Kimberly Hahn, Chris Kay, Andy Cooney, Mark Larson, Rebecca O'Malley, Michael O'Regan, Gail Poole, Blake Riley, Superfan Giovanni, Aidan Nullman, Adam Schaefer, Rob Schultz, Scott Schenker, Cam Smith, Kevin Smokler, Adam Sutherland, TSD, Thomas Unterberger, Matt Warren, and Wayne Wright.